So yeah, this is a new thing, but I think this looks good. I am Damien, um, second year, graduating soon, painting printmaking. Thank you, Noah. Um, and just like a quick introduction, I mean, most people know I'm a Singaporean citizen, I was born in China. And, you know, I really started painting quite uh, quite recently um, when I was, you know, like four or five years ago now. So previously I was an art historian kind of, you know, I did art history in undergrad, but, you know, so throughout this presentation, you know, I'll start with like some of my origins of like why I decided to paint. And then I'll go into talking about, you know, why I think painting is, and then I'll talk about the thesis itself. And at the same time, when I'm talking about some of the more theoretical stuff, I'll scroll through some of my older works just so that there's some things to see. Okay. So here it is, right? In 2016, you know, while I was still an undergrad studying art history, I was visiting the Art Institute of Chicago and I came across a really you know, modestly sized painting by Henri Fontana Tour, you know, someone who worked during the Impressionist times and was like friends with the famous Impressionist of the time. And this painting in particular, Still Life Carnival Painting, and this is the first painting that ever really made me cry. Uh, I think it's the only painting that ever made me cry. So while the painting is interesting in other ways, the tenderness of the image is really what caught my eye and I, I think it's what made me cry in a way. Uh, for me, the rhododendron plant, right, in the foreground is in a way both opulent and also a little shy and the way the leaves curve the way the leaves curve and almost touch the tangerine on the right side of the painting and how the petals of the flower you know, almost cup the fruits in the bowl, um, for me, evoked a kind of melancholy longing and distance. Uh, but perhaps this melancholy is something that all still lives share, yet I think this painting with how I projected agency and the, um, you know, like how I projected like a kind of anthropomorphism towards the plant gave it a sort of agency and depicted a desire attributed to the objects themselves in the painting. The, whole, the Rohan Dijon in particular had this, this drive almost to communicate through the painting. And unlike a still life that indicates a sort of simple absence of human subjects, uh, I think this painting itself revealed a kind of agency in the painting's motives, a positive presence instead of just absence. Uh, Fanon Latour's prominent signature in the painting, which you can see like here, indicated by my face, um, uh, you know, really mark the painting as a painting. You know, it's two-dimensional and it's, you know, artificial. Yet somehow the explicit, unambiguous knowledge that this is a painting accentuated melancholy of the image in my eyes. Upon reflection, I think it revealed a kind of core matter of painting and possibly crucial core. If a painting desires to be understood, right, like the way the plants are trying to touch the fruits, um, are its elements, you know, color, form, doomed attempts at communication? And is this tragedy possibly the point? Would painting's attempts to communicate, is this similar to this leaf trying to touch a tangerine? When never, like, is there always going to be like a gap, right? And is this tragedy possibly the point? And is that why I cried? And is that, are the tears the point of painting in a way? So, when thinking about paintings, you know, unlike tools that are, and these are just some of my older works, unlike tools that are most obviously mediated by functionality or other objects in the world that are first defined by space and physicality, I think a painting's presence is heavily predicated on that of the artist and an artist's need to communicate, maybe due to, you know, its two-dimensionality two -dimensionality and the anthropological evidence, uh, origins, like recordings, you know, I think it has a strong adjacency to text where communicative function is quite prominent. But communications, you know, often happens from one to another and thus the artist as communicator is quite palpable. But paintings differ from text due to its, you know, also materiality, sensuality, and then the undeniable, I think, objectness. Paintings are objects that very obviously speak, that do so without speaking, right? Like the suggestive gaze of another. Um, and in this case, in paintings, the painter's gaze, surrogate gaze. And the surrogacy leads to an unfortunate and I think almost pitiful consequence. It, and that is the painting's inevitable failure, is that of the painters, 
right? Because like I said, a painting wishes to communicate, but there is always this inevitable failure in communication. But as a painter who still paints, we are still trying and all the while knowing that, you know, I'll probably fail in some way. And I think to characterize this willingness to participate in such an endeavor, it's, it's oxymoronic in a way, like a hubristic vulnerability. So perhaps in painting, an artist's vulnerability manifests not only in a painting's wish to communicate, but also in its fundamental failure um, to do so. Then the emotionality in an image comes from its specificity and concreteness, a sureness that the image must mean something. If a painting stares back at the viewer, it's an intense gaze, right? Full of desire of searching for that perfect object or subject of reception that can never be found. And when this break asserts itself, this disappointment asserts itself, it leads the viewer to realize that, yeah, there's a gap between me and the painting. And once the gap is realized in, in the consciousness, it acts as a, almost like a metaphorical mold um, where like our, you know, our understanding takes form and it kind of, you know, it represents a kind of manifesting of failure into something that is, you know, not just a negative absence, but becomes a positive presence. And I think once recognizing this, you know, positive form of failure, this seeing failure as subject, as, as an object itself of the painting, you know, it can lead to ineffable feelings adjacent and similar to melancholy, terror, or maybe even the sublime. Um, but despite the marked terms of failure, you know, like I said, I think it's a pleasurable feeling because by representing this gap, we brush past some truth, right? A commonality of some sort of shared ambivalence, desire, and sadness, um, a kind of melancholic sublime in a way. So here are some older works. So moving on to my thesis, um, my paintings in the thesis uh, exist in two separate parts and they're placed in two separate spaces and exist in two different scales. So one of the spaces is indoors, um, as you can see in this, in this space, uh, comprising of three large paintings hung in a small room. Uh, and this is in the Anderson Gallery, I think D, probably the smallest, one of the smallest rooms in Anderson. And the other space is a constructed structure um, position outdoors, housing a single smaller painting that is thin but long. So the two spaces that occupy are, you know, both small and restrictive. That only it's only really comfortable for one person to be in the space at a time. And the spaces, while quite separate, are supposed to viewed to be viewed one after the other. So first, the indoor space located in the VCU Anderson Gallery. And after that, the outdoor installation located just beyond Anderson uh, on a lawn. I think the sequential viewing, um, so there's this very strong element of sequential viewing that there's this act of entering a space and exiting and entering again. It is really a attempt to create almost something that's ritualistic. Uh, and this kind of quasi ritualistic uh, endeavor uh, really stems from some studies I previously did on the Hindu caves of the Shiva uh, at Elephanta, where devotees are really taken on a very extreme, uh, a really specific, and even for that time, a centric ritual, um, you know, to really, you know, it's eccentric because it's, you know, it's not general, it's not standard, it's something that's very specific to that space. And this the ritual is sometimes even counterintuitive to other standard ritualistic practices of the time. So what the ritual did was to really, you know, the devotee walks around the outs, kind of like the, the outer ring of the cave and they look at um, like statue setups. And it, what that does is, you know, it generates vague clouds of signs and meaning. Um, which can point to like the multitude of narratives that the typical Hindu devotee might be familiar with. Because if you know, if you're even a little familiar with Hindu narratives, there's just so many and so many variations of the like similar narratives. 
And then these signs are then verified in a final central object of the lingam, which you can see in the, the middle here, the lingam, um, which kind of semiotically explodes with meaning, you know, after that process of walking through everything else. And you know, the lingam as a symbol is very interesting because it's simultaneously something that's really concrete, um, but it's also like a mystical abstract sign, which you know represents everything. So there's this, so what it does, I think, is it absorbs and reconstitutes and, and it reconstitutes that cloud of signs and, and narratives that devotees are previously reminded of. And you know, it and it, and that it re regenerates something that's you know more solid and maybe knowable. So similarly, I mean, I'm not doing something that's so clearly ritualistic. It's you know it's not religious in this, a similar way, but I'm just taking some of the mechanisms of how such a ritual was you know supposedly held, um, and kind of using it in my own practice. So similarly for me, like initial entering into the space in the Anderson Gallery, where these three large abstract paintings are positioned looming over the viewer. That's kind of a, a way to kind of generate that fall of science, right? The images in the three paintings are abstract, but they do contain formal allusions to bodily forms and representational signs. Um, so the paintings function in a way that's, they are suggestive, right? They're suggestive paintings but I don't think they, they're so suggestive that they become descriptive. So the idea is for it to generate this symbolic cloud, this vague allusions to symbols that you can recognize without these things coming together fully and concretizing into something that's clear and narrative. So the three paintings are similarly sized, they're 80 times 54 inches, pretty large in relation to this space. And the first painting that's facing the entrance is arduous track. So arduous track, which is, um, you know, I think out of the three paintings, it is possibly the most concrete and figurative out of the three. Um, and even though the elements in the painting are fragmented and abstracted, uh, the picture playing is, you know, in this painting is still arranged in a way that, that we can, that I think you can still kind of discern space, right? Um, there's this, that this, curves sloping in from the top two corners coming in and that overlaps each other and creates a kind of like quasi landscape of sorts. Um, so yeah, the space is still discernible and the mass of the mass of forms in the center of the painting is also meant to imply a, like a strong physicality um, in the, you know, in the, sim in the symbolic structure of the image, right? They're modeled, even though it's irrational, like the light's not coming from any specific place um, but it still creates shadows and light. And I think some of these forms resemble rocks, bodily forms, uh, you know, whatever. Um, and I think that's the idea. It's the idea is to create something that while remaining unrecognizable is suggestive of something familiar. Um, and this mass of forms, because of how concrete and physical they, they are, um, a certain kind of agency and presence over the situation as a whole that the painting is creating. So the reason that this central painting is made in such a way is so that the first painting that the viewer experiences orientates them in the experience of the rest, the other two. So that they understand the physicality of the paintings and a physicality that makes the viewer aware of the possible agency and meaning of the paintings, even as the obvious illusions dissolve more aggressively in the next two paintings. So the next painting I'm going to talk about is a painting that's positioned on the right side of the space, right? This is a predominantly red hued painting. It's titled No Touch. Um, it's painted in a way that it's, you know, much less delineated and defined than arduous track. The brush strokes in the painting, uh, you know, are mostly fragmented, translucent and layered, which is a, a mode of working that I enjoy, um, the layering. But you know, the, I think what I'm trying to do here is the direction of the strokes themselves, even as they're fragmented and atmospheric in a way, they can also be seen when viewed out a little bit, when zoomed out a little bit as 
as defining a kind of space and 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 um, and defining a certain something, a certain physical quality to the space and the background. So, you know, the goal here again is to generate a kind of pictorial setting where, depending on how you're viewing it, um, the picture can both take form and yet essentially stay quite formless or dissolved. I think a good example is like this, you know, like this fire thing in the corner on the left side of this fire thing, um, you know, like on the left side of it, it's really, it does appear like flat surfaces, but on the right side, there's clear shadow-like strokes and color, which almost models this um, column, this column on the side into something that's more physical. So, you know, like, I think that those are some of the plays that I'm trying to do with this painting itself. And in the last painting of the space, um, this is called A Decision. Um, the painting's title is A Decision. It exists in a similar kind of visual space as No Touch, I think, even if the forms here are a little more, more biomorphic and I think much more suggestive. But, you know, fragmented strokes again and, you know, thin translucent layers. <clears throat> I think this is a good example of another element that I put into the other paintings where there's this, I think, moments of intensity, right? And in this painting, you can see these two blocks of yellow. It creates that kind of um, point of intensity in the painting. I think what that does is to, it, it, it creates this, um, it gives the painting kind of agency such that the painting can be seen as almost looking and beholding the viewer um, and the, and even in the other paintings I've previously seen, you can see similar points of intensities in the painting. Um, and it, what it does is to kind of invert the relationship of the viewer, the pre-understood relationship between the viewer and the painting um, and kind of revert that or like conflate that directionality that we usually think about. <clears throat> I think what's very important too is the way, uh, let me see. Yeah, in, ad in addition to the points of intensity, I mean, the way the paintings are installed themselves, um, you can see here, the two paintings on the slide sides are actually slanted ever so slightly towards the viewer, right? And that's to actually make the viewer feel acutely aware of the position uh, in this painting space. And as a subject that is kind of imposed upon by the paintings. The room in which the paintings are kind of located is small relatively to the scale of the paintings themselves almost creating a space that can be rather tight and almost restrictive. While this seeks to augment the, the element of the looming paintings, at the same time, this is also meant to remind the viewer of their physical presence and the presence they exert in this space. A situation that is, you know, clearly deliberate and felt, I think, because, you know, I, I think it's not a very typical way of displaying paintings. The viewer then not only reads the paintings as screens, projecting an image, communication, but also as maybe modifications upon the environment of color, atmosphere, and floating signs. So now I'll move on to my installation outdoors. So the title for this installation um, is A Room for My Painting. And it's located just beyond the Anderson Courtyard. Um, I think some of you have already been there. It's kind of a medium-sized grassy lawn, um, and the installation is quite rather tall, it is, you know, 10 foot tall A-frame structure, triangles. The actual interior of the space is pretty small and it's wide enough to really only fit one individual comfortably at a time. Uh, even getting in there, you know, the opening is really, you know, you really have to duck in, in a way. And yeah, if you can see there's this, this triangle in the front that slides open, if you haven't been there yet. And you can, you know, duck in after you slide that open. So the design of the structure is meant to be both conspicuous uh, in relation to the surrounding uh, grass, but also integrated so that it, it looks like it belongs there. And that, and thus the color is green still. Um, and the plastic side, the plastic roofing uh, material, it's really kind of, you know, it's, it's kind of glossy. So it creates a kind of gleaming quality to the structure and it makes the structure like a gleaming ext extrusion out of the earth a little theatrical, uh, maybe even a little monumental, something that's 
kind of confident, you know, in, in how it's positioned. However, you know, like what's very important is that the interior of this space, right, is, is kind of the inverse, right? This assertiveness in its, in its external form is kind of inverse in the interior space, which is how, which houses the long thin painting, um, you know, and suspended by these metal wires, you know, I think kind of precarious in the presentation. And this precariousness is complemented in a way by the shyness of the actual visibility of the painting. You know, it's not super visible. <laughs> uh, there's no real, there's no artificial lighting at all. And light enters through that small rectangular aperture, as you can see, um, only one aperture in the whole structure. And that's where the light lets in. And so, you know, this level of light will only illuminate a small portion of painting brightly at a time. And it only happens in the morning. Otherwise, it's just going to be this like kind of diffuse atmospheric lighting that's, you know, honestly not super great, um, even though there is a vibe to it. <laughs> but the lighting of the interior of the structure, you know, it's painted in kind of a light absorbing black paint. So it's like heavily dictated by the exterior conditions and the whims of the weather. So it creates a certain shyness in the presentation of the painting. Um, it's kind of bad visible. Uh, it's veiled in a kind of bad visibility. It's almost hiding in a way, and the mercy at, and it's at mer the mercy of something that's um, very exterior to it, as opposed to the shiny assertive presence of the structure that it is housed in. The painting itself is made in a media in a medium that uh, I really enjoy. It's egg tempera. It's a medium that's much more fragile and prone to damage compared to the medium of oil and acrylic. Bringing this painting over to the structure was a whole thing. Um, and this medium creates a kind of surface of really intense color built up in thin translucent layers. And, you know, it's been said that this medium creates a kind of jewel-like quality. Uh, and the image itself is figurative and recognizable, you know, as you can see. And it's a, like a composite human figure. Um, the dimensions of the painting is like 69 times 10 inches. So it's approximately the height of a person, but much narrower than a person's width. Um, you know, in a way that's kind of restricting the figure in the painting, kind of shrugging its shoulders while it's trying to, you know, position itself in, in like a resting pose, a repose in a way. Um, so, you know, what the painting is trying to do is trying to create this person who's hoping to be unseen um, and, you know, showing a level of discomfort. And I think together with the environment that exists in, you know, it again expose, uh, opposes like the the confidence of that, that external structure in a way. So both spaces um, create this highly specific and intimate situation and the space of the paintings um, kind of focus the viewers on the particularities of image and their relationships to the image. And the viewers encourage and directed to view the paintings with a high level of intention. Um, and you know, with that expectation that with this intention, I can find meaning, some concrete meaning in the painting. But I do think the ultimate shyness and the bad visibility of the painting in this, in this outdoor structure, it kind of avoids easy reading um, because, you know, we want that semiotic explosion that we see in the lingam, but then this hides itself instead of asserts itself. So meaning kind of still remains elusive and fragmented and thus the expectation kind of collapses a little bit. Um, and, you know, it remakes it remakes this kind of um, importance, this idea of being important because um, the outdoor structure signals a kind of importance, but what this painting inside instead is an image of vulnerability. But with these two opposing ideas put together, I think it kind of remakes both ideas at the same time, kind of positioning the object of the painting that's not shy out of pure introversion or anxiety, but also maybe shy out of a kind of self-importance. So conflating these like op opposite ideas is something that I like to do and integrating them within each other, I think it really causes a kind of slippery meaning in the image. And in this case, you know, there's a, the mystery, I guess, can pertain to the idea of like vulnerability and egoism and how a painting like this in this space kind of swings between the two. And 
having these like conflated opposites, I think that heightens the difficulty of the painting and it augments and makes the difficulty of these paintings in understanding them much more noticeable. Uh, and despite the representational nature of the painting and the structure and the quasi ritualistic way the two installations are made, you know, to set up expectations of meaning, you know, again, it remains difficult to understand. But the thing is, I think it's important for me that, you know, it doesn't just remain difficult to understand, but the viewer is kind of aware of the difficulty itself. You know, it, it moves from being just an attribute to something of a presence. You know, it's not just an adjective, but, you know, it becomes a thing which can be further reflected upon and maybe possibly extend to what I was talking about earlier, like this awareness of, of this positive failure in painting. So, you know, these difficult paintings are not meant to be solved, you know, uh, difficult. Instead, I think di the difficulty, uh, I'll engage in the metaphor here, like it's like the bodily challenges of a long distance runner or like a hiker or when I was in the military, like uh, someone who's doing a march, you know, it becomes the thing of focus and practice, right? Instead of like futile attempts to resolve the pain or to ignore it, the runner kind of gets into their trance by giving into and focusing on the dull ache of the body and the labor of rhythmic breathing. So this is not to say, I'm not saying that painting is like the same as running a marathon or whatever, but you know, I think many of us have felt that deezing sense of fatigue a malaise when we go to a museum, right? And we just go through painting after painting, trying to make sense of what they're saying. What I'm trying to offer is kind of our alternative. And maybe I'd offer it a little forcefully here uh, in which the painting is, which the painting's inherent difficulty becomes a subject matter of, of a, in a way. And the screen through which these other signs, you know, understand narrative and all of that, that comes after, you know? But the difficulty comes first. It is to become. It becomes the main subject matter, and it offers a more alternative to really for the need to fully understand, and instead proposing a pleasure in failing to do so, and resignation really. So hopefully, for me, like viewers of this exhibition, uh, when in the small quiet space of a room for my painting, can move beyond the need to really perceive the painting and understand the painting. In, in perfect terms and find that maybe the sublime object, whatever that is, and you know, despite all its problematic history of the word, the sublime object can maybe reveal itself only after acceptance of failure and rest in a way beside our common vulnerability and some shared impossibility of understanding. Yeah, thank you. And that's my, that's my talk. Thank you, Damien. Um, perfect timing. So uh, now we're gonna open it up uh, to questions. I have a question to start. Um, you were talking in the beginning and also in your thesis um, about painting is failing because of a painting's inability to communicate. Um, so I guess I have a two part question. Is that something that's true of some paintings or is that endemic among all paintings generally? And part two, is, is that just a painting thing or do you think that's true of all artworks? I think, yeah, I think I, I've thought about that for sure. Um, I think in terms of the first part of your question, I think ultimately my position is that it is something that's endemic to most, if not all paintings. Um, that's my position in this matter. Um, I think the reason for that is, I think this will also answer your second part, is that it is in a way something that's true for most forms of communication. There's this shared impossibility of really understanding and really communicating in almost all forms of communication. Mm -hmm. What for me is interesting or important or different in painting is that painting I think has a very strong um, way of really bringing out and really talking about, not talking about really depicting this difficulty, this impossibility, right? That's the impossibility that painting is, is effective in depicting it um, and making us aware of it. Um, 
because of you know its materiality, its dual existence as something that's kind of similar to symbols and text, but also as something that's very physical and object-like. Um, yeah. Can I scroll through some pictures while people think of questions, I guess. <laughs> Maybe I'll follow on to Hillary's question because I think that was quite a good question. But in relation to your response, you know, when you think about um, something like the Giotto's Arena Chapel mm -hmm. um, or the use of painting in terms of yet another kind of religious um, context, uh, you know, the I think the the ability for painting communicate. Do you think the ability for painting as communication uh, is also a failure there? Um, I would say, yeah, um, especially when it comes to um, religious images where, you know, I think there's this preconceived notion um, or not preconceived notion, but this like kind of accepted idea that, you know, pictures in religious um, settings back in the days were kind of used as a way to kind of tell stories for the illiterate. Um, that's, I think I've read a few articles about that and it's usually, I mean, I can't really, I mean, obviously I can't really tell you the sources because it's been some time ago, but I do think that um, it's been said that that's kind of contested. Like the idea that the, these images can really tell the story of the Bible um, without anything really helping um, is, is quite, for me, actually, it's quite, you know, like it's it's kind of a incredible thought because it just seems so in, in, impossible. From what I heard is that, you know, it, it's kind of like visual aids in a way. Most of the time, these paintings or stained glass windows instead acted as visual aids for like the pastor or the priest or whatever to really, you know, talk and, you know, maybe say, yeah, that, you know, that's a thing. So it, there's always text and speech accompanying these things. So images as a whole, it's just so hard for them to, to, to really communicate in clear terms because, because of that, you know, like, like we can see a figure and we'd be like, that's a figure. I can understand what the figure is doing, but to really understand all of the strong specific specificities of the narrative, I think an image will, you know, almost always like fall into failure without a lot of other help. But then, I mean, that, that, kind of implies a separate question, like, like what does the images, what do the images do? Like, why do people want the images in these religious situations? Because I think these images, you know, like were very helpful in creating like an emotional understanding of those narratives, right? Um, and images in a way kind of, uh, I mean, this is separate from my thesis, but in terms of these religious imagery, they're painted in such intense ways to really drive home the emotional uh, uh, message of, I think, the sermons or whatever. I think that's kind of why these images were so prevalent in these like religious settings. Um, yeah. I don't know if you can see the chat, Damien, but there's a question there. Yeah. Was there a reason you use oil paint for large paintings in the room and egg tempera? For the wine, the outside installation. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, this is a this is a good question. Um, there are two reasons. Uh, I can give you the first is the um, practical reason, and second is the conceptual reason. The practical reason is that egg tempera is a very slow medium, <laughs> extremely slow, and um, you know, painters who use them and use and painted large paintings back in the days, you know, had huge workshops to really help them with that. Um, and, you know, those big paintings were just very difficult, if, if, if I had to admit, to really execute with egg tempera at such a scale um, myself. Um, so there's always the option, right, of like, I can make 
smaller paintings in that space. Um, but the reason I wanted to make big paintings is because I think big paintings kind of function in, in a way that's a little different from the small paintings. And I think honestly, Ek Tempera, even if you can make a big painting out of Ek Tempera, it's not, it doesn't take advantage in a way of the properties of Ek Tempera. Um, the bigger paintings, I wanted to create more atmospheric, uh, abstract imagery where, you know, like brush strokes are more evident, um, different ways of physicality and the way the paint is manipulated is more evident. Uh, and that honestly, oil is the best way of doing that. Uh, well, for Egg Tempera, it's, for me, it suits like a small painting because Egg Tempera has this preciousness, fragility, and, um, and you know, smallness to it, um, which I think, you know, used in small paintings just enhances that effect because you are actually encouraged to go into a small painting and discern those like singular consistent strokes uh, of egg tempera painting. Um, and I think that's, that's mainly the difference why, but also it's kind of just impossible to make such big paintings in, in like half a year in egg tempera. That's just true. <laughs> Hi. Um, Hi, Sydney. I wanted to ask about what your thoughts are about the potential that architecture has for failure. Um, because that was such an important theme, it seemed like you used the architecture related to the installation mm -hmm. as a way to, or the way you spoke about it was as a way to like singularly shift our relationship with the paintings and our bodies. But is there room for failure there too? Yeah, I, I mean, I think so. Um, what I'm describing is really the intentions of, of my installation and my decisions. But I can see that, you know, even in these spaces, there can be branching paths of experience. For example, in the outdoor installation, the idea is for me to create an intimate space where you spend like a long time with the painting in quiet but there are people who are a little claustrophobic and you know, that creates an almost opposite kind of experience for them. Um, and that is an architecture's failure. And I think architectural, like architectural conceptual failure is something that you know, like we've experienced many times across like the 20th century. Um, and, but you know, that's not really the, the object of my, of my thesis, I guess, but I mean, definitely it is, a subject of failure. I just, I think in a way it's just a little more, sometimes I feel like it's much more obvious when architecture fails, you know, compared to like when the image, because it just feels so functional in a way. And so in, in that function, I mean, obviously the architecture is more aesthetic, but in the end, I think it's more functional in a way. So if that function fails, then it's a failure, you know, and paintings, they don't, there's no like specific pointed function as much. So it's less, it's more subtle in that way. So I think the difference is there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I also have to say, like, despite, in spite these, like, kind of elaborate installation formats um, of my paintings, like, I think the paintings themselves, you know, I also just, that's in the end my, my main focus. You know, I see myself as a painter. Um, and these installations overall are, are things I make to really augment the paintings or, you know, make the paintings be viewed in, the, in ways that's, that can be a little more, um, maybe even critical or interesting um, rather than just image on the wall. But my questions uh, most of the time revolve around painting um,
because of the road I see myself. I, I sort of have a question slash like statement type deal. Can you hear me? I just want to make sure my audio is good. Yeah, you're good. Okay. All right. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting for me uh, to hear you say that you have a primary position as a painter, given that, you know, I, in addition to the statement of the, the sculptural elements existing as an augment, as a modifier, or as a means to augment or shift the perspective of the viewer onto the work. I, the smaller works that have like these like framing devices that, you know, go outside of like traditional framing methods for me exist more as like painting, like moves, you know what I mean? Like they exist as like these like, um, they're frames within the frame of the image. Like they're frames that exist very subset or offset of them. So I'm, I'm curious as to how like, as these works get larger and these shifts in scale happen, how these framing devices are gonna evolve more and become even more dimensional. Like this piece is like a full three dimensional like jig, whereas the other ones are like small and flat. I just, I don't know. I'm curious as to how like, when they get larger and larger, what dimension will they exist in and how many dimensions can they potentially engage with? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's sort of a question. I'm, I'm a little all over the place right now, sorry. No, that's fine. Thanks, Alfred. Um, I mean, I think the main difference is that obviously, I think you really pointed out well, um, on the wall there, it still engages in the two dimensionality of the painting. Uh, I think those smaller objects are kind of um, smaller paintings are uh, in a way a preemptive, I sh I'm showing them because they were what led me to these bigger installations, right? Because it's what first, let me thought of, think about a viewer's position in relationship to the painting, how they kind of position the head to see the painting and how they kind of block off views um, and how the painting transforms and becomes more object-like within this quote unquote frames. Um, and I think moving into a larger, larger format is a way for me to engage more totally with the body um, in a way, um, more than just like singular, you know, small moves, but this is, you know, a whole bodily entering. Uh, and also I think the outdoor structure, something that struck me a lot was also how you engage with the hearing, right? Like there is this sound, the sound of the exterior of the outside was very loud not loud, but it, you know, you can hear things, but once you go in, there's a very palpable quietness that happened. And that was something that I found really interesting. And, you know, something that I'm thinking might be very, uh, very productive and fertile as I move forward to think about. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank